This is Newsroom. Hello and welcome from Johannesburg in South Africa. I'm Sam Marshall. This show is live and broadcast from our studios in Auckland Park. We're also streaming live on YouTube with the entire show available on our YouTube channel. We chat to former Bafana Bafana coach Clive Barker, ahead of the memorial service of the late John Shoes Mashwero. He's online. Uh, we find out more from about the uh, Brown Fisher Memorial Week that is wrapping up in Bloemfontein. And we delve deeper into the psychological makeup of sports stars who commit crime. But first, let's get the day's news with Anindo Mel. Good morning, I'm Anindo Mal. Let's just have a look at the stories making headlines today. SAA CEO Monwa Bisle Kalawe has resigned with immediate effect. South African Airways announced this morning that Kalawe has agreed to step down as both CEO and director of the national flag carrier. The newly formed anti-xenophobia task team is expected to attract thousands of people to its march in Pretoria today. The task team consists of non-government organizations and civil society. Yesterday, people turned out in huge numbers around the country to demand an end to the recent wave of xenophobic attacks. Meanwhile, another meeting to promote good relations between South Africa and foreign nationals will take place in Pretoria. President Jacob Zuma will meet with leaders of organizations representing foreign nationals from within Africa and also Pakistan and Bangladesh. The meeting will take place at the Safako Mahato Presidential Guest House later this morning. The calls for submission of nominations for candidates who want to contest DA leadership positions will end today. It has been reported that outgoing party chairperson Wilmot James is expected to announce his decision to stand later this morning. This after DA parliamentary leader Musi Maimane announced his candidacy last weekend. The top leadership positions to be contested are those of federal leader, executive federal chairperson, federal chairperson and three deputy federal chairpersons. The party will hold its federal congress in Port Elizabeth on May the 9th and 10th. The Minister of Higher Education will call on all tertiary institutions to cut ties with their counterparts in Israel. This after the Israeli government denied Minister Blake Nizamande a visa to travel to Palestine. His spokesperson says the reason Israel gave for the refusal was that Dr. Nizamande is one of the most vocal anti-Israel government ministers. The minister was supposed to travel to Palestine today to promote collaborative collaboration in research between the University of Johannesburg and institutions in Palestine. SABC Chief Operating Officer Claudi Mutsaneng has successfully launched an appeal against a Cape High Court ruling and will be at work today. The court earlier ruled that he be suspended within the next 14 days and the disciplinary action against him be instituted by the SABC. Even if we had not lost an appeal, it would not be true to say he is suspended immediately because in terms of that court order, it is the SABC that is directed to launch those disciplinary proceedings against him and they have 14 days within which to do so. And Bafana Bafana star John Shoes Mashweo will be remembered by many today. Mashweo's memorial service will take place at Grace Bible Church in Soweto at 12 midday. The football legend died on Tuesday at the age of 49 after a long battle with cancer. After a lengthy, successful football career in Turkey, he returned to the Amakosi where he lifted two league titles. Well, remember, you can find all of those stories on our Newsroom Facebook page. Just search for Newsroom. You can also follow us on Twitter at SABC Newsroom. Sam, over to you. Thanks, Anine. And it's with your last story that we continue this morning. Former Bafana Bafana coach Clive the Dark Parker has paid tribute to the late footballer John Shoes Lesiba Mosway by saying he has lost a son more than a footballer. Mosway was also part of the Bafana squad that won the 1996 Afghan tournament under the guidance of Barker. A memorial service is expected to be held today at the Grace Bible Church in Pimble, Soweto to celebrate the life and times of Shoes. 
Condolences continue to pour in since the former Bafana Bafana midfielder passed away on Tuesday. Coach Barker joins us on the line. Coach, thank you very much for joining us here on Newsroom. I can only imagine it must be an incredibly tough week for family, for friends of shoes and for you. Please reflect on uh, when you heard the news and just the loss, I think, that is shared by absolutely many. Yeah, well, I went to see him a couple of uh, days ago and uh, uh, met with his mother and um, I could put my hand in his hand and I could feel that there wasn't all the strength there. And then when I walked away, I knew that there would be uh, two things would be happening that she would pass away because I knew how sick he was. Um, and two, on the other side, and the happy side for me is that at uh, half past three tomorrow morning, uh, tomorrow um, in heaven, uh, there will be a game. And of course, there's going to be a new player up there, and, and that's going to be shoes. Coach, take me back to your first introduction to a very young uh, shoes Mishweo. You described him as a son. And you had a very public relationship and a very public fondness for him. Take me back to that, that moment when you met him and you knew that not only are we looking at a star, but you're looking at a player, a football legend that would uh, creep into the hearts of many South Africans and uh, fans of the game all, all over the world. Yeah, that's, you've summed it up aptly. He was the, um, he was the Barishnikov of, of, of football. Um, he had feet, shoes that, uh, that could dance. Um, he was the orchestra leader uh, in the band and uh, he was just um, something so special because you didn't have to tell him what to do. You, uh, you, shoes, Monsieur and Dr. Kamala, they were two of a kind. You could say to them, you, you could just talk to them and you knew exactly what, what you wanted out of them. And uh, they were marvelous players. And shoes, um, absolutely legendary and an absolute superstar. And of course, was able to put everything into the game situation, and that's what made him so good. You were quoted as saying that the team of 96, Shoes, Kamalo, Hellman, Mweti, Butalezi, and Tinkler in the midfield could beat any team in the world. And uh, I think there are many fans uh, that would agree with you. What made that class so special? Why was that the era of shoes? And, 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 and many, in many ways, why is he and will he always be remembered as a great player? Yeah, well, these players come along only once in a lifetime. And uh, when you looked at the life of modern-day football and you, you see Messi, um, you can't compare them because Messi's a better player than Shoes. But, but Shoes was in that uh, the same bracket. He was able to uh, push up on the left foot, push up on the right foot. He was able to quicken the game. He was able to slow it down. Uh, he was in complete control the whole time. His mannerism on and off the field, um, after travelling to the big matches, he would sit at the back there. He was quiet. But he knew exactly what he had to do, and um, uh, that's what made that team so good because they could play anybody anywhere in the world um, and they could hold their own. Coach, you're on the line with us right now, but what we're going to show uh, our viewers is a clip uh, out of the uh, 1996 Bafana game up against Ghana in the semi-final of that Africa Cup. I'll get a reaction from you afterwards, but let's play this clip quickly uh, and just reflect on the skill of uh, John Shoes Mishweo. OK, I'm going to say this to you and your viewers. Uh, enjoy the clip because I haven't got to that link here. But I'll talk you through what I can remember uh, about Shoes and his performance and the goals he scored. Chance out for Fish. Oh, it's in the back of the net. Magnificently scored. South Africa lead by one goal to nil. Mishweo has scored after 22 minutes. South Africa lead in the Nations Cup semi-final. Glorious goal. Oh, number shoes. Shoes is not going to be able to do it. Number shoes. Shy of shoes. Shy of shoes. Candle, I'm going to go down. Candle, 
The one sense that you get, Coach Barker, is that he always had a fantastic sense of where the ball was and he had the ability to find those spaces. And, you know, what a lot of players today work so hard at, the ability to control and be um, concise and stay calm under pressure. Yeah, you should be a coach the way you're going on. Again, that is exactly the truth. Uh, his first touch is what set him apart from everybody else and it was under control from... From day one, and then of course the, the ability to glide into the space and exploit that, and of course his ability to score goals and, and finish off like um, only he could. Uh, yeah, that tournament, there's no doubt about it. Um, he was the player of the tournament. Um, he scored the most vital goal um, against Algeria when we went uh, one. One all just before the, the end of the game, and then he picked the ball up and he dropped the shoulder, dropped the hip, came inside, went outside, got to the edge of the 18-yard area, and of course finished off magnificently. And of course that gave us a 2-1 victory that we needed to get to the semi-final. Uh, that game and, and the part that you've just shown the, the viewers it was exactly what made him so good. The overhead kick. Um, reaction straight away because we were up against it and um, then we never looked back and um, it all fell into place and um, of course Shoes got the two goals and Sean got the other one but it was absolutely magnificent uh, all around. Fantastic. We talk a lot about the man on the field but just share your very very uh, personal uh, experiences with the man off the field with us quickly coach. Yeah, that's exactly, he was so quiet and he would um, look after himself. He would go into his, if they called it like jock colours when they used to play cricket uh, into a bubble and he was like that. He would he would have his own time and uh, he wouldn't uh, joke. He would be very, very serious about what he was doing. Um, uh, we would leave him alone because we knew that he knew what he had to do. And Ted, uh, Dimitri, I must take a lot of credit for, uh, having him at Kaiser Chiefs and they won back-to-back -back, um, league titles. Uh, he was magnificent at that time in his career and then of course he went back to Turkey a couple of times. But um, there were a lot of people who were responsible for shoes, but I think he was born to be a footballer. Um, I think he was born to have the feet that he had. And, uh, of course, uh, it's the sickest day of my life. Um, we've lost a couple of the uh, the, the famous side and Cesar Matong and, and our shoes and of course other footballers in between but the shoes is the one that will hit us the most because of what he performed and how he did it. He was class, he had panache, he had everything. Coach, we're going to reflect quickly on some of the comments our viewers sent in related to uh, Shoes Mishroyo, but uh, just to put you in the picture very quickly, we're talking to Coach Clive Barker, and who's reflecting uh, uh, on his friend, and uh, in many ways he's described him as his son, John uh, Shoes Mishroyo, who passed away uh, earlier this week. The memorial service expected today. It'll be at the Grace Bible Church in Pimble, Soweto. Let's just take a look at your tweets. You can, applause, of course, send them to at SABC Newsroom. This comes from Tim. It says... Uh, hashtag rest in peace uh, shoes and condolences to the Mishwe family and to all other uh, soccer lovers. Uh, Coach, very quickly, when we talk about the legacy of uh, shoes, what what is that legacy? Um, I think the legacy for him was to be able to have um, a network of where he could actually show um, his skills. And, uh, he was able to... Um, put into practice what everybody would, would expect of a great artist. And he was an artist. He was a performer. Uh, he realized that um, football was there to entertain, and that's what made him different. I took him to Amazulu right at the end, um, and, of course, he, I took him for a reason. He was already over the hill at that stage and on the way down. But I kept him in the game because I wanted him to show the other players exactly how to play the game. And he was able to transform that. Um, and, of course, the last couple of years he spent with us at Amazuri. Uh, fantastic player.
Coach Barker, thank you very much for joining us uh, on the line. Uh, he'll be heading to that memorial service today. Former final final coach uh, Clyde Barker talking to us about the late John Chu's Mashwe. Okay, let's take some more comments on uh, uh, Twitter. It's Tokazani who says he proved that age is nothing but a number and the importance of discipline. He is and will forever be our legend. That's hashtag rest in peace. Uh, shoes. Mdu says John Shoes Mishwero was a great ambassador of our African football, a very skillful and intelligent player. And I'm sure a lot of people will agree with you, Mdu. From Lefty, it says hashtag rest in peace shoes. Your moves on the field were legendary. From your highness, it comes uh, since hashtag Kaiser Chiefs dedicated the championship to hashtag shoes. It's only fair that hashtag Amazulu survived relegation in his memory. And we do know that there's a relegation battle uh, at the bottom of that log. Kaiser Chiefs walking away the champions. Now let's take a look at the front pages from around the globe. Starting in Chile, the International New York Times reports a giant cloud of ash and smoke rose from the Calbuco volcano during a storm yesterday. The volcano erupted for the first time in four decades this week, taking emergency officials by surprise. Then moving to the USA in the Washington Post, says uh, President Barack Obama regrets the death of two hostages who were killed in a counter-terrorism operation in the border region of Afghanistan and Pakistan that happened earlier this year. Lastly, in Israel, the Jerusalem Post says as Israel celebrates its 67th birthday, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu warned the country's enemies that the IDF will stand ready to defend their land at any time. Let's take a look at what's happening around the country today. We start in Johannesburg, where Czech fugitive Radovan Kretscher and seven others are expected to appear in the High Court, sitting in the Palm Ridge Magistrates Court today, by allegedly conspiring to kill a police officer and a forensic investigator. Then in, the, then in Port Elizabeth, a couple are expected to appear in the Magistrates Court by allegedly being part of a syndicate that distributed images of babies being abused. The couple are allegedly part of an international child pornography ring and then in Cape Town, the, tra the trail of a bus driver is said, or I should say, the trial of a bus driver is said to begin in the Otwan Regional Court today. The 24-year-old accused faces 10 charges of culpable homicide and one of illegal immigration after the bus he was driving overturned, killing 10 passengers and injuring dozens more in May last year. A collision between two buses in Johannesburg this morning has left one person dead and about 100 others injured, according to Metro Police. The cause of the crash is still being investigated. That's where we leave newsroom for now. We take a break. You don't go anywhere. To Africa. This is Eritrea. The president is Mr. Isaias Afewerki. Eritrea got independent from Ethiopia on 24th May in 1993. The population is over 5 million people. One of the major languages spoken is Arabic. Monetary unit is the Nakfa. Welcome back. You're watching Newsroom. Thank you for choosing to stay with us. Now, the Mangahung Metropolitan Municipality will be celebrating anti-apartheid activist Bram Fischer's 107th birthday. It's been happening this entire week. Now, the second annual Bram Fischer Memorial Week features various activities set up to celebrate Fischer's life. The commemoration week coincided with the launch of a commissioned award-winning theatre production, the Bram Fischer Waltz, a stage in full view of spectators and the who's who in the entertainment fraternity. Bram 
Brown Fisher was a political activist and a human rights lawyer who died at the age of 67 in 1975 in Bloemfontein. The play won the Silver Ovation Award for the Best Drama at the Grahamstown Festival 2013 and the 2014 Adelaide Tambo Award for celebrating human rights through the arts. Manghung Executive Mayor, Councillor Thabo Mignoni joins us now from our Bloemfontein studio. Sir, good morning. Thank you very much for joining us here on Newsroom. Uh, let's talk about and reflect on the week that's uh, currently underway in that part of the country. Uh, some award-winning plays, some amazing lectures, but it's also about educating the youth. Yes, this is all about um, educating the youth and uh, also to send a message that says all of us, particularly the youth, are the beneficiaries of efforts and actions that were taken by people like uh, Bram Fisher. So our main intention is to bring an awareness about uh, this remarkable uh, African giant and basically to say also to the people of Mangawin that please let's internalize uh, his vision because basically he comes from uh, Bluefontein, he comes from Mangawin. Hence, we are having that uh, theater production which is sort of uh, displaying his life and his efforts and also his commitments about seeing a better South Africa, of which I think presently we are. And basically, it is also about saying to the youth of South Africa, make sure that you also are taking this country to a better and higher level than where it is uh, at the moment. So during the course of uh, this uh, week, we've been having those uh, lectures. We will also be carrying on with the theatre production in our area here for students, scholars, and we will also be having the bikers who will also assist in collecting clothes for those who are less fortunate so that we can distribute them and we will also be distributing food parcels. We will have a golf uh, day in celebration of uh, Bram Fisher during um, Saturday and also we will be opening a community hall in uh, one area here called Butabel, where the majority of poor people uh, are staying. It is one of the best community halls that we'll be having around uh, Mangawu. We will also, on Sunday, have uh, a freedom uh, walk, 5 kilometers, 10 kilometers, 21 kilometers, encouraging uh, South Africans, obviously, to lead healthy lifestyle, but at the same time, attempt to bring uh, social cohesion in our area because we, we intend having both black and white people, including foreign nationals, uh, taking part in that uh, work, just to send a message that we are human, we are one, and basically, we want to build a united South Africa, even if we are in a diverse uh, country. So those now, are some of the things yeah. that we will be looking at. So now, we've seen the Memorial Week kick off on Monday. We've had uh, some lectures in Mangahung talking around uh, certain issues. What has been the feedback? It's only the second annual Brown Fisher Memorial Week. The innovation, the fact that a play was included shows that there's innovation around how we celebrate and discuss our heroes of, our, of the past. But what was some of the feedback that you've received from, um, from people on the ground? I must say we have been receiving very positive uh, feedback. And uh, what we realize is most people didn't know much about uh, Bram Fisher, unlike, of course, uh, our icon Mandela and others. So basically they appreciate the fact that uh, the Mandelas that we are talking about were in a way saved to become what they are because of uh, people like Bram Fisher. People are appreciating uh, this, and they want to know more about the life of this uh, remarkable man who grew up, of course, in some places, but mainly here in Bluefontein. And I think, uh, really, we are attempting and achieving that goal of bringing this awareness about this remarkable man. In terms of celebrating the legacy, you've mentioned uh, the activities that are on the cards for the remainder of the week. 
but uh, at a higher level, at, uh, at an executive level, what are, what are some of the other things that we really need to engage to let the youth know that these icons existed, that our history is such an important uh, and integral part of where we're going because we've seen so many issues related to, to statues, so many issues related to identity, uh, not only in South Africa, but how South Africa um, reacts and reflects on the African continent. Yes, I, I must uh, indicate what we are attempting to do in this regard. To say, look, we might have to attack the symbols of apartheid uh, colonialism, but the main issue today is not about only those uh, symbols. It is about attacking the fundamentals uh, in terms of the economy, mainly, that are making it difficult for poor people to get out of their poverty. We are fully aware that inequality is busy increasing in this country. And we are saying to young people, Bram didn't want to sit in his comfort zone and look into the luxuries that were bestowed upon him as an African royalist in that sense. But he also decided that he will take side with those who are less fortunate which were the African majority during that time. And I, for us as young people also, we need also to forget the comfort zone if we want to build a better future for ourselves. That's the message that we are trying uh, to bring to young people. And also at the higher level is to say, we as South Africans, we must stop being timid when it comes to challenges that are facing the majority of people, mainly uh, poverty. It is high time that we stop talking about these things and do something, as Bram Fischer did. He did not just uh, talk about apartheid. He joined the Communist Party. He joined the liberation movement. He acted there. He led. Sure. He became part. And that's what basically we need to do a sort of things. So we're going to leave it there, but thank you very much for joining us uh, from our Bloomfontein studio. That is the Mangung Executive Mayor Councillor Tabo Manyoni talking to us about the Brown Fisher Memorial Week. It's only the second annual one. Now, uh, tomorrow is World Malaria Day, and last year the World Health Organization reported that there is a dramatic decline in the amount of malaria cases and deaths since 2000, but more than half a million lives are still lost to this disease every year. To tell us more is the director of the Wits Research Institute Institute for Malaria, Professor Maureen Kutsia. Professor, thank you very much for joining us here on Newsroom. And I, I think almost it's important and prudent on us to, start, to start the discussion with always the basics. A lot of people still don't know what malaria is. That's true. Um, the fact that, that mosquitoes actually transmit malaria um, is sometimes forgotten or, or not known by a lot of people that are actually affected by the disease. We're talking about uh, World Malaria Day and we're talking about uh, the World Health Organization reporting that there's a dramatic decline in the amount of cases. It's still uh, not gone, but what are we doing right now? Doing What are we doing right this time around and seeing that drop? As, a past, uh, as opposed to in the, in the, the past. past. What didn't we understand back then? Well, I think that, that part of the success that we are seeing now um, is due to a massive rollout of um, insecticide-treated bed nets, particularly across the African country. There are many, many um, NGOs and, and companies that are involved in the rollout of the bed nets. And it certainly has had an impact, and you can see that from the figures that the World Health Organization mm. puts out every year. Unfortunately, it's also had an effect on the mosquitoes in terms of insecticide resistance. And we're now seeing a major, major increase in insecticide resistance um, in, in just about every African country, which is, is a serious concern. And there's an awful lot of work that's going into looking at alternatives so that we don't lose those gains that we've made. From a research perspective, Professor, what are you, what are you looking at now? You're saying that there's an increase in... Uh, um, mosquitoes being uh, pesticide resistant. How does that change the focus of your research? Has that always been part of it? Well, South because we heard of drug resistant. Uh, yes, yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, South Africa experienced firsthand in 1999-2000 what it means to have an insecticide resistant mosquito 
in your rural areas. And we had a massive epidemic of malaria. Over 400 people died in 2000, which was unheard of for South Africa before. And that was thanks to an insecticide-resistant mosquito that had come back into the country. So, so from then onwards, our research has focused on insecticide resistance at all levels, mechanism, you know, the molecular side of things, all the high-tech stuff, um, as well as just basics of what's, um, what do mosquitoes do when they come into contact with an insecticide. Yeah. Um, and we're also looking at, at alternative methods of control. So using a sterile insect technique, for example, um, is something that we are busy researching um, down in KwaZulu-Natal. Yeah. And uh, so we're, we're looking at, at all kinds of opportunities for doing things differently yeah. so that we don't go back to 1999, 2000. On our, on our video wall at the moment, we're showing uh, malaria areas and uh, hotspots uh, across the, the world. Just, just your reaction to that. And I know you're, this, is, this, is your, this is where... Uh, this is the area that you play in. And, and I think how much of that is still, Professor, the fact that um, a lot of us really don't know a lot about it. We're, we're told to, that when we travel to these areas that we need to get um, the right kind of injections, the right kind of clearance. But how serious are we uh, with these warnings and are people taking heed of, of, of uh, these warnings that are issued? Well, I think that um, those people who travel to Africa and don't, take precautions against malaria are being really short-sighted. Um, the problem is that, that many African countries just don't have the resources to, to go in and turn those red hot spots back into a pale yellow. Um, there's, there's a lot of funding that's coming through from the Global Fund, and they certainly do try to help countries mm. improve their mosquito control. But it, most of the money goes into drugs, and, and bed nets. The World Health Organization has reported that the global vaccination targets for this year are off track, with at least one in five children still missing out on routine life-saving immunizations. Um, can you give us an update on, on that? On immunizations? Yeah, are we still sitting, I mean, according to the World Health Organization, if one in five children still, are still missing out, where's the gap? How do we address that issue? I am not an immunizer. Sure. I have nothing to do with, with immunization of children against um, lots of different diseases. Yeah. And I, really, I can't talk to that because I don't know, um, I'm not familiar with the subject and I don't, I'm not familiar with World Health Organization's take on immunization. For sure. Um, but, but, but I think yeah. it gives you an idea of, of the, the lack of, of protection mm. that the general public in most of Africa actually have. You know, even, even treating malaria um, is usually done by the people themselves. They go and they buy it on the street corner. Yeah. Um, it's, not, it's not... In South Africa, you have to go to a clinic and then you get referred and you get a blood test done to prove that you've got malaria. Well, in many places, that just doesn't happen. So, you know, it doesn't surprise me that, that the immunisation yeah. story is also not as good as it ought to be. Professor, we're going to leave it there, but thank you very much for joining us. That's the uh, director of the Vis Research Institute for Malaria, Professor Maureen Gutzia, sharing her insights. Tomorrow is World Malaria Day, and I think the uh, overarching theme here is no more. Get access to information and learn how you can protect yourself, especially if you're traveling or if you're living in areas that potentially um, you might be affected by. Let's just take a look at your tweets. Please remember to send us your views on Twitter at SABC Newsroom. Uh, it comes from Ashraf. It says, uh, happy world hashtag malaria day. Let's heal all. And then Solar Charles says, 55 countries are on track to reduce malaria incidences by uh, 75% by 2015, says the World Malaria Report 2014. That's hashtag WHO, hashtag malaria day at Becky Edges. And there's some uh, pictures of, uh, as we talked about, people educating themselves uh, about uh, malaria. And it goes, what are you doing to contribute to the fight against malaria on hashtag malaria day? Your effort can make a difference.
Then some more pictures are on our screen, uh, more related to World Malaria Day, which uh, uh, is uh, tomorrow. You uh, would have uh, heard our interview with uh, Professor Maureen Kotzer related to some of the research that's uh, being done here in South Africa. Now, today's picture of the day comes from intern, uh, I think it's Zeus captioned, Shoes, a real sportsman, will be remembered. A little bit earlier, we had a chat to former Bufana Bufana coach Clive Barker sharing his uh, um, intimate moments and uh, uh, just his experiences, life experiences with John Shoes uh, Mishraya. And uh, you can see that uh, there's some uh, interesting comments and uh, videos on, um, on our tweet. Now, uh, today's tweet of the day comes from Yvonne Chaka Chaka. Wow, Mama Africa. Working together, we must strengthen the potential of people, communities and countries for a hashtag malaria-free uh, world and that's hashtag defeat malaria and at rollback malaria. That's all in reaction to tomorrow, which is officially World Malaria Day. Now, let's take a look at what's happening on our Newsroom Facebook page today. The call for the submission of nominations for candidates who want to contest the top Democratic Alliance leadership positions will end today. Then Nigeria's military said yesterday that troops are still advancing on Islamist Boko Haram's last known stronghold, dismissing reports that landmines had forced them to retreat. And according to U.S. officials, the United States drone strike in January that targeted an al-Qaeda compound in Pakistan near the Afghan border inadvertently killed an American and an Italian who had been held hostage for years by the group. You can find all of these stories and more on our Newsroom Facebook page or visit our SABC website at www.sabc.ca.za forward slash news. Okay, let's take a look at uh, Bright Eye in southern Chile is on alert after the Corpuco volcano burst into life for the first time in half a century, forcing 5,000 people to evacuate with it while it lit up the sky last night. Authorities have declared a state of emergency and have deployed army troops in areas that are in a 21-kilometer radius around the volcano. The troops are evacuating members of the community and taking them to safety. The twin volcano first erupted on Wednesday as night fell and the second early Thursday before sunrise. Naba has continued the tradition of passing stories onto the next generation using a platform that owes stories to a far more greater audience. Zombie no go go unless you tell them to go. This is what the audiences all over the world knew Fela Kuti for. Join Musam Khalifi on Afro Showbiz every Saturday at 19.30 CAT. Welcome back. You're watching Newsroom on SABC News. Let's just have a look at the stories making headlines today. SAA CEO Monwabisa Kalawe has resigned with immediate effect. South African Airways has announced that Kalawe has agreed to step down as both CEO and director. The newly formed anti-xenophobia task team is expected to attract thousands of people to its march in Pretoria today. The task team consists of non-government and organizations and civil society. Yesterday, people turned out in huge numbers around the country to demand an end to the recent wave of xenophobic attacks. And the call for submission of nominations for candidates who want to contest DA leadership positions will end today. It has been reported that outgoing party chairperson Wilmot James is expected to announce his decision to stand later this morning. 
This after DA parliamentary leader Musi Maimane announced his candidacy over the weekend. Remember, you can find all of those stories on our Newsroom Facebook page. Just search for Newsroom. You can also follow us on Twitter at SABC Newsroom. Sam, back to you. Thanks, Anine. Now, this week, former Bafana Bafana player Lebohang Marula appeared in the Boxburg Magistrates Court after, after allegedly attempting to hijack a cigarette truck with two others. This, however, has not been the first time South African sports stars or stars around the world have been the news for all the wrong reasons. So today, Newsroom takes a closer look at why some of our big sporting names commit crimes. Joining us now to talk a bit more about this, we are joined uh, by a senior partner at eye to eye Africa and sports psychologist, Julian Delahunt. Julian, good morning. Thank you very much for joining us here good in morning, studio. Good morning. So when we see big-name sports stars at the highest level committing crimes or we see former sports stars in trouble for an illegal activity, we often, as the public, wonder why, what, what has happened. I mean, why would you rise that high and fall that low? Yeah, well, again, it's, a, it's quite an interesting question. And, uh, you know, when we unpack the psychology of, of the mind, we often talk about um, our behavior being dictated by our, our self-beliefs. So when we work with individuals, we talk about um, the conscious versus the subconscious mind as an individual. Mm. And in a sports person specifically, um, and I guess in South African sport, um, from a, from a uh, football cultural perspective, there's not a culture of man management, um, of, of guiding these sports stars through a, a very quick rise to fame. Often many of our sports stars come from impoverished backgrounds. They come from an area where they were never exposed to the types of highs that they will be facing during often what is a short career. And during that time, they're not prepared for life after football or mm. after sport. So we talk about conditioning. We've seen it. Uh, we can talk about Oscar Pistorius, O.J. Simpson. We can talk about so many other uh, sports stars that have, that have fallen out of the limelight uh, due to criminal activity. But while they're at, on that rise to stardom and while they're at that level for however long they are, they're conditioned. They're conditioned to always be the best, to think they're the best, to push their bodies, push their minds. How much does that play into uh, um, some of the things that we've seen, the levels of aggression? We've seen it with, with rugby players. Once they drink and they go into pubs and they get into, conf uh, into conflict situations with ordinary uh, South Africans, it's almost as if they, they don't know how to switch off. Well, I think while, whilst they're in the limelight and whilst they, they're living effectively public lives um, where, where their lives are basically placed in cotton wool and everything they do seems almost like a pseudo reality to them they then start blurring the lines between what is reality and what is, what is entertainment and what is their everyday environment where they effectively are public figures and they are superheroes to most mm. so they find it very difficult to then step out of that environment and and live a normal real life is that even years after they've, they've operated at that level? I mean, we've even seen top boxers being, um, being arrested for beating spouses. We've, we've seen football players. I remember a clip of a lift where you saw a football player in the NFL beating his partner in a lift, and it looks like he's just absolutely lost it. Yeah. Well, it's the same behavioral psychology that, uh, that plays out when you find lotto players or, and, and lotto winners winning a massive lotto jackpot. And the research shows that within two or three years, 70-odd percent of, of individuals who've won lottos go back to a position where they were or previously or even worse than what they were. That's the subconscious mind and the belief saying to them, well, perhaps I didn't really deserve this in the first place. Perhaps I was living a life that wasn't really mine and it was great while it lasted, but I go back to subconsciously where I believe I should be. And if you believe that, you're, uh, that you're a, you, know, you come from a crime and an impoverished background and that you may not necessarily have deserved all this fame and fortune during your sporting career, when you then find yourself ending your career, moving back into perhaps a hometown where you came from with friends and associates that, that you were previously involved with, it's very easy to then go back to the subconscious mind trying to prove to the conscious mind, and it's quite, I can't teach psychology in, yeah. in five or ten minutes, sure. but, but, but really the, the subconscious mind dictating the outcome of your future. 
Just quickly share um, some insight in the work that you're doing with, with sports stars. Is it, is it around self-esteem? Is it around being able to switch on, switch off, finding the best level? What is it, Julian? Yes, absolutely. So some of our clients uh, internationally, uh, some of the Premier League football teams that we work with, and obviously lo locally um, working with some of the rugby teams, we spend a lot of time man-managing individuals. We spend much of the time, and one, one would be surprised the type of psychological um, situations and issues that many of our top sports people face on a day-to-day -day basis. So we spend a lot of time working with them whilst they're in, in the mode of being a, a, a professional sports person, managing not only their sporting lives but their personal lives as well, and then post uh, sporting career. So we prepare them for a life after sport as well when, they, when they're reaching that pinnacle of their career. Julian, thank you very much for joining me uh, and, sharing your, and sharing your insight. That's uh, Julian De La Hunt from I to F I Eye to Eye Africa, he's a sports psychologist sharing insights on why uh, some of our beloved sports stars commit crimes. Now, uh, let's go and take a look at what people are saying on uh, Twitter. Please remember to send us your views on Twitter at SABC Newsroom. And it's all related to uh, uh, the notice xenophobia uh, that is uh, sweeping the nation. We've seen marches all over the country, uh, people standing up and speaking up against it. That, of course, uh, says uh, from Food of Food, say no to xenophobia, march at Nelson Mandela Metropolitan University. Hashtag say no to xenophobia, not in our name, we are one. Some other pictures, of course, from that march as well, and some powerful, powerful pictures uh, coming through on social media. The march has begun, say no to xenophobia, and that's NOMI, the norm. Let's look at some, uh, some other pictures as well coming through on our Facebook page. And, of course, you can share yours with us at SABC Newsroom. Mohamed Patel says, we at VIT say no to xenophobia. Great turnout for the march against the recent um, hashtag xenophobia attacks. Now, from today, some of South Africa's music legends will take to the stage to play familiar chart toppers to audiences at the Cito Land Festival. Remember, we had this uh, start of the uh, a couple months or so at this interview. Along with the entertainment, some of Johannesburg's tastiest Portuguese cuisine will be served. Of course, all proceeds from the Portuguese themed festival will go towards the Lacito School for the Physically and Mentally Handicapped. And here to tell us a little bit more is the spokesperson of uh, Lacito Association, Naimia Contente. Contente, thank you very much for coming, uh, Naimia. Right. Let's, let's talk about um, today is the launch day. I can Correct. only imagine that you're sitting there on tenter hooks. Absolutely. The numbers will come through. What can we expect? Well, our entertainment, as we, you, you just mentioned, we, we really are South African first. We have also our, singer, our Portuguese singers and our folk dancers, so we bring back a bit of the Portuguese flavour. The food, as you know, all the Portuguese uh, uh, special dishes. Um, we have the fun fair, we have uh, during the uh, weekends and, and holidays entertainment for the, the children on, uh, on the ground that we supply. So there's a lot, there's absolutely a lot, lot going on. And I think the, the most important part that we mustn't forget that this money raised, that everybody that comes through those gates, that that money goes to a worthy cause. Absolutely. All that money goes to a worthy cause because we have to, 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 we run the school, of course, and it's, it's, it is an NPO, so there's no subsidies coming from anywhere else. So it, we're dependent on this show, very much dependent. There are a lot of sponsors that come through and but uh, it costs us over 4 million rand to run the school per annum. So we need to make a success of this festival, definitely. Okay, we're going to talk about uh, just the amount of numbers of people that are coming through. We've got one of your uh, artists that's Correct. performing at, your, at the festival. Last week, you brought us, I think it was another band called Motherland Correct. that was also here uh, in, in studio. How do we find the right mix of entertainment um, and every year make sure that the festival speaks to a new market, that it brings the old market through, that those that have loved the festival keep on coming and that we can open the festival up to new people? Well, we try and cover everybody or the, the community. So we do for the youngsters and we do for... There you, there's your proof. And we, we've got the Afrikaans afternoons, uh, normally on the Saturdays, and we have... Um, for the older people, we really are covering for them this year. So we have a, a very good lineup. So anybody wanting to come can go onto our website and, and look it up. But we, we have catered for everybody ac across the line. Parking, ticket prices. Right. 
parking was very, is very important. We do not want, we, we're asking our patients and our visitors to come through park and to not park in the street. We have made parking available down 10th Street into Forest Road, which is the, the rugby field next to our festival. And we're asking everyone to go through and to park in those areas. It's secure, we've got security, and we've got security up the road, and we've got security when they go back to their cars. Uh, Compu ticket is taken over our gates. It's 80 Rand and 50 Rand for, for the children and the uh, 12. Quickly, our artist is singing in the background. We're about to wrap up. Just tell us a little bit about her. And she's one of your artists performing at the yes, Central She's one of our artists, and I think a new kind of artist, and she's wonderful. And we're very happy to have her on our show. Let's go to there. Thank you very much for joining us here yeah, and talking to us about the Cita Lab Festival you. that kicks off today. It is a must end event, and you just absolutely have to take everybody to go and check it out. That's one of the many talented artists performing at the Cita Land Festival from tonight. You can, of course, join us with this year's live circuit cabaret singers. There's just so much going on and she operates under the name of Sam Fran. Hey, I got her debut single. Okay, that's how we can come to the end of the program here on Newsroom. It's always a pleasure. We love interacting with you. We broadcast live between 9 and 10 from Auckland Park. You can also view us on our YouTube channel. We love interacting with you and enjoy your contributions immensely. This is SABC News. You've been watching Newsroom.